So you are ready? Yeah, whenever you yeah. want. So I, I think uh, I will start one minute earlier to introduce you. So uh, <clears throat> the last plenary session of uh, today's uh, conference is uh, on, uh, I mean, uh, consists of uh, two speakers. And the first speaker is uh, Raffaele Tito D'Agnolo from uh, SECLAY. And he will talk about cosmological naturalness. Please go on. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join all of you uh, virtually today. And uh, in this talk, I will uh, discuss some uh, old problems in our description of fundamental interactions that involve uh, large hierarchies of scale that currently we do not understand. Uh, the first half of the talk will be introductory, given the broad audience, and it will introduce these problems and their significance. And in the second half, uh, I will uh, turn, uh, I will change tone a little bit and speak more to the experts and discuss solutions to these problems that have emerged recently and uh, trace back um, the explanation for these hierarchies of scale early in the history of the universe which especially for the Higgs boson mass, it's a big change of perspective. The experts know that compared to the last few decades of uh, activity, both in theoretical and experimental uh, particle physics. So let me uh, get right into um, the main subject of the talk. So introduce the two characters that will accompany us uh, throughout the, the presentation. So there are two parameters in our description of fundamental physics that have the largest scaling dimension in energy. Uh, one is the cosmological constant and the other one is the Higgs boson mass squared. Given uh, this large scaling dimension, there is a precise sense in which they are the most important parameters at low energy in describing uh, phenomenology at low energies. Uh, more loosely speaking, the cosmological constant determines the maximal size of the observable universe. Uh, and this could be in the sense of a de Sitter horizon or in the sense of a maximal crunching time in an FRW anti de Sitter cosmology. And the X boson mass squared uh, sets the range of weak interactions and also the neutron proton mass difference. So ultimately it is responsible for um, the existence of complex nuclei and molecules and chemistry. So you see that these two parameters are really central even to the description of life as we know it. Uh, so it's only natural to want to try to understand their value. And the simplest thing that you can do is to do an estimate using only symmetry principles. And if you try to do that, for example, for the Higgs boson mass squared, you're going to get a result of this type. So you're going to have a capping squared times the largest uh, scale in your theory squared. And uh, well, if you were willingly to work a bit more, you could even get factors of four pi, again, purely based on dimensional analysis. Uh, but let's not, uh, let's not stray from this simple expression for the moment. So where, where are these two ingredients coming from? And as I said, I, I purely use symmetry. So um, the mass scale is entering because of the selection rules of space-time dilations, assuming that there are uh, masses at the Planck scale. And the coupling is entering uh, due to the selection rules of other symmetries. There, are, there is a shift symmetry or more, it's easier to get actually using an higher, speed symmetry, an higher spin symmetry that is protecting uh, the free scalar Lagrangian that makes the free scalar Lagrangian a stable point under RG flow. If you haven't heard of this before, I invite you to look at the lectures by Ricardo Rattazzi at GGI, which are very nice and informative. But setting these details aside, the important point is that uh, following only symmetry principles, we can get a simple estimate for the Higgs boson mass square that we expect from our current knowledge of uh, fundamental physics. And we can do the same for the cosmological constant. And if we compare this estimate with uh, uh, the measured value experimentally, we find uh, a huge discrepancy. In the case of the cosmological constant, the experimental value is 120 orders of magnitude smaller. In the case of the Higgs boson mass squared, it is 34 orders of magnitude smaller. So we can easily call this the biggest failure of symmetry, or if, if we prefer, of dimensional analysis in physics. However, to be completely fair, this is not yet a problem. 
uh, in our current description of particle interactions. So this is not a well-posed question in the uh, standard model effective field theory. And the reason is mainly that these two parameters are not calculable in, uh, in our current theory of particle interactions. So you cannot turn this simple estimate I made at the beginning into a precise calculation um, and really find a contradiction. However, this, this doesn't mean that uh, it's useless to do the estimate I did and compare it to experiment. Uh, this exercise that we just did is telling us that uh, uh, these two parameters contain precious information about physics at very high energies. So they're telling us that uh, uh, we should start thinking about high energies and maybe thinking about these two parameters will teach us something that we do not yet know from experiment about how to extend the current theory of fundamental interactions. And well, um, to see how uh, this problem reflects in our vision of the ultraviolet, so in our vision of high energies, well, I, I decided to, to, uh, to, to uh, introduce different visions of high energies with, with a humoristic intermezzo, let's say. Uh, by asking what kind of physicist are you? So there is the theorist. The theorist, the way I think about the theorist is a full professor who bought his house in the 80s or in the 90s. Now his house is worth a million dollars. He had a nice smooth career. So he knows that reality makes sense. You work hard, you obey the laws, you follow your symmetry principles and you get the result that you want. And indeed the theorist has a pretty um, platonic vision of the of high energies. He thinks that beyond the standard model, at some scale, there is supersymmetry. And above supersymmetry, string theory is explaining or describing quantum gravity. It doesn't really matter whether the string scale is above or below the Planck scale. This is the, the broad picture that the theorist has of physics at high energies. Well, then there is the experimentalist. The experimentalist, as the name suggests, only believes his own eyes. Uh, and he doesn't want to think about uh, energies that he has not probed directly. So for him, of course, the standard model exists. It's at the same place as for the theorist. Uh, but then uh, he knows that there is some scale where quantum gravity becomes important because again, you can extrapolate this from measurements, but he does not want to uh, make any assumption on what's happening at that scale or in between. So as far as he's concerned, um, until he's going to measure it, there is nothing in between the standard model and this scale. And finally, there is, of course, an in-between attitude that I've called without much fantasy, the theorist who wants to be an experimentalist. And in this case, um, well, again, the standard model is always in the same place. Um, again, you do not want to make any assumption on what quantum gravity looks like. But for many reasons, you believe that uh, uh, there is something in between. It could be supersymmetry or a confining sector or anything else that makes the X mass and the cosmological constant calculable. And you have this vision of high energies because uh, this is the nicest way to explain a lot of puzzles that we see in uh, fundamental physics, to explain gauge cap and unification, to provide a dark matter candidate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And I want to stress that all these three uh, visions of the UV are completely legitimate and they don't even cover uh, all possible attitudes, but they kind of cover the extremes of the spectrum. So they are enough to discuss all uh, distinct conceptual possibilities for the problem that we're interested in. And the problem that we're interested in is why uh, these two uh, fundamental parameters, so these two parameters of nature are so much smaller uh, than the scale of gravity. And interestingly, if you are the experimentalist, you're kind of forced to give the most radical theoretical explanation for that. Essentially, you have one of three possibilities. You can imagine that uh, these parameters um, are always inputs of your fundamental theory. Maybe there is some gravitational S matrix that needs some, uh, some uh, boundary conditions, so some, some input measurements to, to be defined, and the cosmological constant and the X mass are among these measurements that you need to make. So you can never compute them, but only measure them, the same as in the standard model. Or maybe uh, there is some form of uh, mixing between high and low energies. So to really understand their value, you have to understand the theory at high energies and see that there is a cancellation 
between contributions at high energies and at low energy in their calculation, which is perfectly legitimate. This might sound crazy. Uh, it is not, I mean, it is quite radical compared to our typical effective field theory understanding, but uh, we've seen this before. Actually, gravity does suggest that something like this happens. You just need to think about uh, putting a lot of energy into a small um, area of space time, and then you're going to create a black hole, which is much larger. So the bigger the energy, the larger the size of the black hole. Uh, finally, you could also imagine something milder. So another form of UV IR mixing, uh, but, but uh, not so direct. So maybe there are some constraints imposed at low energies by our high energy theory. Uh, an example that you might be familiar with is the spin statistics theorem in quantum mechanics. Within quantum mechanics, it is just an empirical fact, but uh, once you um, go in quantum field theory, it's a consequence of the symmetries of uh, special relativity and of causality. And something similar could be at work here. Maybe not all effective field theories can be consistently UV completed into a full theory of gravity. Uh, namely, maybe only theories where these two parameters are small can be UV completed. And these are all fascinating possibilities, quite radical compared to our current understanding of particle physics. Uh, but for the moment, I'm not aware of any concrete uh, way of implementing any of them. So we should definitely keep them in mind. And uh, they show you that thinking about these problems opens up uh, pretty deep and unexpected ways of thinking about uh, fundamental physics. But for the rest of the talk, we will mostly focus on the theorist attitude. And both theorists, both the pure um, string theory aficionado and the more bottom up type of theorist, uh, have to agree that uh, in their vision of the ultraviolet, uh, the question as of why uh, the scale of gravity is much bigger than, uh, than these two parameters is well posed in the low energy theory. And this is because supersymmetry or something else is intervening at an intermediate scale, uh, <clears throat> making these parameters calculable. Uh, of course, the fact that this is a well-posed question at low energy doesn't mean necessarily that it's also answered at low energy. Uh, so the, the UV IR consistency I was talking about before in, in, that is implemented most notably recently by Swamp conjectures could be at work also in this case. Um, but for the moment, let's focus on the question. So we're still at the beginning of the talk. And then towards the end, we will also discuss um, possible answers. So why do I say that uh, if this is your vision of the UV, then this becomes a well-posed question? Well, the reason is simple. So as I said, these parameters become calculable. So let me give you an example uh, with the x bev and supersymmetry. So in supersymmetry, you can calculate the XBEV as a function of a few parameters. Some of them are SUSY breaking, like MH down, MH up, and some of them are SUSY preserving, like mu. And the important point is that you can measure all of them independently of V, and then you can measure V. So in this case, you can really see if there is a, a, a sharp contradiction or not. Well, not a contradiction, but, uh, but a sharp puzzle or not. Because if you measure, for example, MH up and mu to be much, much larger than what you measure V to be, then you found a cancellation between two parameters that are unrelated and you want to explain in your theory. So the general situation uh, could be described as the fact that you have an observable, which is the sum of multiple contributions. You can compute these contributions in your theory. And then you can measure separately the observable and all the different contributions and find that uh, maybe a couple of them are much bigger than what you measure for the sum. And when you encounter such a situation in physics, you're immediately led to ask one or, or two questions. So whether, so one, on the one hand, there could be a symmetry without a landscape. So you miss the symmetry in your calculation, which explains why the two parameters are close to each other. Or maybe um, these observables is realized in many different ways. Um, either in a large multiverse or within your universe. So I'm sure that the first possibility resonates with, uh, with all of you. The second one might look more exotic uh, and a bit metaphysical, but let me stress that we've seen examples of landscape over and over again, and we can even create them in the laboratory. One simple example would be uh, if you are a condensed matter experimentalist, 
and you prepare a grid of two dimensional, a two dimensional grid of spins. And then you have a dial in your laboratory that allows you to change the temperature of this system. And if you can scan this temperature very, very finely, you're also going to find points where the mass of the scalar that describes the low energy excitations of this system is much, much smaller than the lattice spacing. The lattice spacing in this example is the same as some large energy scale. And if the mass of a scalar that is not protected by any symmetry is much smaller than, uh, than this uh, scale, then you're naturally very surprised. But you should not be because you have created yourself a landscape of values for this parameter. All right, but uh, before getting more into the landscape side of the story, let me very, very briefly review where, where we are at today. So of course, uh, the simplest and mon most natural explanation is that there is a symmetry that we've missed. And indeed, we've looked for it for, for many decades. Um, if you do that, then you immediately notice that the cosmological constant and the Higgs boson mass are live at very different energy scales. The cosmological constant is much smaller and uh, they are also associated to very different physics. So it's only natural to want to separate the two problems. Maybe try to solve the Higgs boson mass problem ignoring the cosmological constant or vice versa. And if you do that, well, you can first look at the cosmological constant and there all attempts at uh, explaining it uh, using symmetry um, have a very, very hard time uh, dealing with experiment because the measure value of the cosmological constant is already much smaller than the particle physics scales that we probed very extensively in the past. So even just the electron would give an unacceptably large contribution to this parameter. Uh, in the case of the Higgs boson mass, uh, it's not uh, quite as simple. So the mass is close to the highest energies that we've explored. However, by now we moved even a factor of 10 in energy above uh, the value of this parameter with uh, our colliders. And we've been looking for the symmetry explanations or dynamical explanations for about 40 years, even more. So I'm counting uh, since the middle of left, but uh, actually we've been looking uh, uh, for a longer time than that. And at the moment, we have not found any evidence that, that these solutions are realized in nature. With this, of course, I don't mean to say that uh, this is not still a valid possibility. It, it is, absolutely. However, I think it is a good time to start thinking about also ideas that might have seemed um, more creative, or if you want to be less generous, crazier in the past, but today appear more justified, also from an experimental perspective. And so in the rest of the talk, I will take seriously the possibility that a landscape exists for these two parameters. Uh, and if the notion of a landscape makes you feel uneasy, as it does many of us, uh, let me remind you uh, a few facts. The first one is that uh, even if it's extremely challenging, this idea can be tested experimentally. So one day we can imagine that humankind will be able to build a very high energy collider and produce the fields that populate this landscape. Um, this, if you have in mind the traditional string theory landscape, there could be other types of landscape that are even accessible today in the laboratory. And we will not have time to see explicit examples in the talk, but if you're interested, I will point you to some references. Uh, the second point to keep in mind is that currently this is the most concrete explanation that we have for the value of the cosmological constant. And I'm referring to the usual Gusto-Polshinsky quantization of form form fluxes plus Weinberg's argument for selecting it. And finally, well, if your vision of the ultraviolet is that of the theorist that I presented before, then you probably also think that a landscape exists independently of these two problems, just due to the properties of string theory, or even if not string theory, if you think that uh, there are extra dimensions, more than the ones that we've seen that are compactified, then again, um, it is very likely that a landscape exists. Okay, so having said this, uh, how does a landscape change our way of thinking about these two problems? So let's look again at the example uh, we um, considered before, just the x -Vev in supersymmetry. So let's say that you discovered supersymmetry, you computed the x -Vev and found that some of the members of these equations are much larger than the x mass. Then in a landscape contest, this is not so obvious anymore that you really have a problem because 
Uh, now you have to ask what is the distribution of these parameters in the landscape? Maybe there is a reason why you are seeing this apparent uh, cancellation. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, even if uh, the problem is still well posed in your theory, so you're still seeing a cancellation, maybe the answer is very different from the fact that the scale of supersymmetry should be close to the Higgs boson mass. Uh, in particular, uh, what I'm gonna talk about next is a class of ideas that adopts a different perspective that not only the cosmological constant is explained in a landscape populated early on in the history of the universe, but also the Higgs boson mass can be explained in this way. And traditionally, this point of view has coincided with anthropic selection of these two parameters. But uh, most of the rest of the talk will be about new ideas that uh, do not rely on anthropic arguments and can even be tested uh, in the next few years in the laboratory. And by few, I mean from five to 20, depending on the idea. Uh, let me, however, uh, first uh, briefly review in, let's say, a critical way, traditional anthropic arguments. So uh, usually these, uh, these arguments are seen as the probably the most, um, the, well, I mean, they're seen as uh, as being as far as you can go from symmetry in uh, in the explanation of these two parameters as possible. But in reality, these ideas always make a crucial use of symmetry. Without symmetry, essentially, we never understand the values of these parameters. And let me be concrete here. So um, the classical Weinberg's argument for the cosmological constant is essentially relating the value of the cosmological constant to the value of the dark matter energy density of matter radiation equality. And the traditional argument for the Higgs boson web, what people call the atomic principle, relates the web to the scale of strong interactions. And this is useful at all only because there are symmetries that protect these two other parameters. So in the case of QCD, there is approximate scale invariance that makes it naturally smaller than M Planck. In the case of the dark matter energy density, we do not know yet, but it's very easy to have a symmetry that, uh, that satisfies this inequality. So without symmetry, anthropic arguments would not help us too much. And indeed, um, this is true also for these more um, recent ideas on how to solve these two problems using, uh, using a landscape. Schematically, you can think about uh, this whole class of ideas in the following way. So early in the history of the universe, you have a symmetric sector, which naturally has mass scales much smaller than M Planck. The symmetric sector is coupled to the standard model in some way that I'm not going to specify for the moment. And the standard model uh, has a landscape of values of the X boson mass and the cosmological constant, which could be, as I said, the usual string theory landscape populated by eternal inflation, but it could also be something else. Uh, it, could, it could just be, for example, a scalar field rolling down its potential. And uh, as it rolls down its potential, it's scanning the cosmological constant. And it's also scanning the X mass because it has a coupling, say, to H squared. So this landscape is not necessarily what you have in mind if you're used to string theory. It could be many different things. At late times, this coupling between the symmetric sector and the standard model uh, select the values that we observe for these two parameters. In particular, from now on, I'm going to focus mostly on the X boson mass due to time limitation, mostly. Uh, and um, the selection mechanism can happen in one of many different, one of, let's say, three ways, broadly defined. This uh, distinction that I'm going to show you in the next few slides is my personal uh, classification of these ideas. So it's just for you to uh, get a comprehensive picture, but uh, probably other people will disagree on how to categorize precisely these ideas, but it will be very useful in, uh, in the rest of the talk. So how does this selection process take place? Well, uh, the most uh, traditional option is anthropic. So maybe at late times, the standard model landscape still exists in the same way it existed at uh, early times, but observers exist only uh, when the values of these parameters are very small. The second option is that the selection is statistical, meaning that in some sense, yet to be specified, 
there are many more vacua in this landscape that contain the observed value of these parameters compared to vacuous that contain uh, values that are very large. And the last uh, and my favorite possibility is that the selection is dynamical, so that this coupling is essentially killing uh, all the vacuum in the landscape that do not have the observed value of these two parameters. And for, uh, as I said, from now on, we're going to talk about the X-Web. And for each one of these three possibilities, um, there are a few examples in the literature. Yeah, I've listed uh, the best known ones, but if you feel that your work has not been represented here, please let me know and I will add a citation for the slides on the website. Uh, and let's now look at each one of these three categories uh, um, separately. So let's look at an example from each to make these, uh, these general ideas more concrete. So anthropic selection, we already talked about this. In the case of the Higgs boson, essentially uh, one can show that uh, complex nuclei and molecules and chemistry exist only if the x web is not too far from the QCD scale. So in my uh, schematic representation from before, the symmetric sector is just QCD, the coupling to the standard model are just the Yukawa couplings, and the landscape could be whatever your favorite landscape is. Maybe a friendly landscape in the sense of Arcania Med, Dimopoulos, and Kaku, uh, where only the dimension full parameters are scanning. Because if you start scanning also the Yukawa one, the Turner one, then these arguments don't hold anymore. Uh, as far as statistical selection goes, let me give you the first example that I'm aware of from Valley and Vilenkin in 2003. So imagine that you have a four form that is, as usual, uh, the exterior derivative of a three form, like in the classic Brown Teitelboim solution to the cosmological constant problem. Uh, then, okay, you can write down uh, a general Lagrangian with uh, the kinetic term for this, uh, say, higher form electric field, and a coupling to brains that source this, this electric field. And finally, you can add also higher dimensional operators that couple uh, this electric field to a scalar. If you do that, um, you can, again, follow the same step as in brown title point. So if you imagine that uh, this electric field has some large value in the background uh, early on in the history of the universe, then quantum tunneling will generate bubbles where the electric field value decreases. And you can imagine this process as spontaneous per creation. In the case of an electric field, you would uh, create uh, electrons and positrons. In the case of desired form field, you uh, nucleate these brains that then expand. If this process takes place during inflation, uh, the walls of the bubbles might never touch each other. So the expansion of the universe might be faster than uh, the expansion of the bubble within uh, space time. And uh, given a sufficiently long time, you might populate all values of this electric field. And since the mass of the scalar depends on the values of this electric field, you're also populating all possible values of this mass. So this is very similar, as I said, to uh, some old ideas for the cosmological constant. Um, <clears throat> the clever part is that uh, you can use a Z and symmetry. So again, as you can see, symmetries are always there. So you can never get rid of them if you want to solve the problem to choose appropriately the charge of the brain. So if you choose the charge of the brain to be some high power uh, of the scalar field, then at every step, so every time you nucleate a bubble, uh, the variation in the scalar web <clears throat> sorry, it's going to be smaller. So at every step, you have a smaller variation. So uh, values of the web close to zero are much, much more finely scanned than uh, large values of the web. So most of the vacua in this landscape that you constructed will be close to zero web. Um, this, of course, assuming uh, a mild hierarchy of initial conditions, namely that the initial web of phi is a little bit smaller than Planck, but order one smaller, it's enough for this idea to work. And of course, if, uh, if you're familiar with these ideas, you can immediately see the problem. The problem is that uh, um, quantum tunnel is an extremely slow process. So in general, to realize this landscape, you need eternal inflation, which means that then uh, you cannot really quantitatively say 
that what's the probability distribution of your vacuum because of the usual measure problem. And this is a common problem to the statistical selection mechanisms. So now let's get to um, the last of the three possibilities. So dynamical selection, which uh, is probably my favorite, but of course this is a personal bias. And as I said at the beginning, in this case, um, you're imagining that the landscape early on was populating all possible values of the cosmological constant and the Higgs web. And at late times, only the values that we observe uh, survive. And I'll give you an example um, from crunching that was initially developed for the cosmological constant by uh, Chaba Chaki, Mikhail Geller, Tamer Volansky, and collaborators. And we later applied it to the Higgs boson. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about um, the latest uh, uh, way to apply this idea, which solves simultaneously both the uh, puzzles surrounding the Higgs boson mass and the strong CP problem. So the question as of why theta is so small. And the basic idea is as follows. So initially, you have this landscape of values for the Higgs mass and, and the theta angle. Then after the QCD phase transition, all um, universes where the Higgs web is outside of a certain range and the theta angle is large, crunch. Sorry, or the theta angle is large. Here I made a mistake in the slides that I should that I should correct. So the only universes that survive after the QCD phase transitions are those with the observed value of the Higgs web and the theta angle, meaning that today these have expanded and the multiverse look like it's only populated by vacua where uh, we observe uh, uh, a reality similar to ours. And the way to implement this mechanism is extremely simple. Essentially, you just need two scalars, a lambda phi to the fourth potential and a coupling to GG dual. Um, <clears throat> we will see that uh, this coupling to GG dual is not an accident. So there is a reason why we're solving the two problems together. And the reason is that GG dual is the only operator in the standard model whose vacuum expectation value depends on the x band and it depends also on theta. So it's kind of natural to try to solve the two problems together in this framework. And you see, so the construction is very simple and we've chosen the signs of the mass term and the quartic capping in such a way that uh, the two scale arts look like the two pictures at the bottom. So let's look at phi minus first. Phi minus has a positive mass squared and a negative quartic. So in the absence of the coupling to the X, its potential is this green line. So it has a minimum near the origin and then a runaway direction. Of course, this runaway direction is, can be easily UV completed. Um, <clears throat> then if you turn on the coupling with the X, after the QCD phase transition, this will give a potential to phi minus. And if the X value is too big, this potential is going to destabilize the minimum near the origin. So this- Rafaela, you have three minutes left. Ah, okay, okay. Then, then I will speed up. Okay, thank you. All right, so the basic picture in this story is that uh, if the X-Web is too big or it's zero or the theta angle is too large, you are destabilizing this minima near the origin, you're rolling down the potential and crunching. So I will uh, speed up now. Um, in this case, well, the symmetric sector are these scale arts that uh, are protected by a shift symmetry or scale invariance. So they have naturally small masses. The coupling is given by this GG dual operator and the landscape can be the usual, uh, say string theory landscape, for example. Um, so from these three examples, you might have noticed that uh, anthropic and statistical selections, selection uh, do not necessarily require uh, new physics at low energy that is more than gravitationally coupled to the standard model. So they're extremely challenging to detect. I would argue that they are also a bit less appealing theoretically than the dynamical selection possibility. The statistical one, because it uh, often runs in measure problems and the anthropic one, because it requires some detailed understanding of what observables are. So uh, to conclude the talk, I want to make a general uh, phenomenological remark on this dynamical selection mechanism. So there are a bunch of ideas in the literature. If you look at them, they all seem unrelated but they all have one aspect in common, that they need to couple the symmetric sector to the standard model with something that is sensitive to the x web. So you can do the simple exercise of asking what changes in the standard model as we change the x web, and we did this exercise with Mima and Yundo. And of course, you'll find that the spectrum changes. 
But if you look at local operators, they are all sensitive to the cutoff. So you discover the hierarchy problem again. So the problem of why the X mass is so much smaller than the Planck scale. There is only one exception, which is precisely GG dual, as I said before. Uh, well, I won't have time to show you why, but I'm sure that the experts know why. Uh, otherwise, I will be happy to answer questions at the end. So in the standard model, there is this only option. And so uh, this, uh, this class of ideas is giving you an important message for experiment, which is that axon-like phenomenology is related to the X boson mass puzzle, which is something very surprising if you think about the problem in traditional symmetry ways. You can ask, are there other possibilities that are GG dual? And yes, if you go beyond the standard model, you can add new gauge groups and uh, do the same as GG dual essentially, but you need some matter with a Yukawa coupling to the X. So you're going to produce to predict, to predict vector-like leptons. Uh, you can also add a second X doublet. So you're going to predict a weird two X doublet model different from the usual type two to HDM. And all these operators have been used in the literature before, and they give you very characteristic experimental signatures that are very different from what you're used to uh, from traditional solutions to the problem. You might ask if there are other possibilities in principle, there are, but you should keep in mind that it's extremely challenging to make these uh, kind of operators in beyond the standard model physics consistent with experiment, because you always need new physics, which is lighter or comparable in mass to the X. So you have sharp targets that cannot be decoupled. In this plot, I'm showing an example for the 2HDM, but uh, well, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the conclusion. So um, in the talk today, I try to introduce to you some uh, uh, central issues in fundamental physics today that force you to think about high energies and maybe even to change your perspective on, on high energy physics quite a bit compared to the usual IFT plus symmetry uh, prescription. Uh, in particular, I focused on ideas that look for the origin of the weak scale early in the history of the universe. And in doing so, I showed you that uh, um, <clears throat> We are very far from having said the last word on the problem experimentally. Actually, there are a bunch of new signatures that we can explore in the near future, both with the colliders that we already have and with new experiments targeting action like particles and early universe cosmology. So thank you very much. Uh, thank I you. I have not gone too much over time. Yeah, we only have uh, two, three minutes for the questions and preparation. So <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I will accept only a few uh, urgent questions, if there is. So can you check this uh, Q&A, Rafaela, or not? Uh, let me see. Um, can I... I'm having some trouble. Maybe OK, OK, question. then I can. Yeah, okay. In the, in the meantime, if there is any question. So I, I've been asked about uh, um, a growing discrepancy in the cosmic dipole inferred from radio galaxies and QSOs and CMB. And he's saying that, and the uh, Eoin O. Cole Gain, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, I apologize if I'm not, is saying that this is suggesting that the U universe is not uh, FRW uh, and that the discrepancy is growing to the five sigma level and is asking how uh, this leaves what I, what I said so far. Uh, so I would say that uh, in answer to the question that uh, um, well, what I discussed about the two problems, of course, uh, stays exactly the same. And uh, most of the, the solutions that, uh, that I discussed assume an FRW cosmology, so they should be modified. Um, exactly how, I'm not sure, but I, I am pretty sure that uh, um, the basic uh, conceptual ingredients that I discussed and the structure of these solutions will, be, will not be modified because they do not rely extensively on any particular aspect on, of FRW. Um, the real crucial ingredients are the symmetries in these weakly coupled sectors and the type of coupling to the standard model. 
uh, this this was in the q a uh, i don't know i see also something in the chat i oh, no, this this was you reminding me that i was yeah saying. okay so well, among... yeah, sorry for, for going over time i'm staying until the end in case there are more questions later. yeah among these uh discussion panel if there is any questions you are free to ask if not i might ask one so compared to this uh anthropic selection Dynamical selection just prefers to have a typical, I mean, our universe to be typical rather than uh, exceptional. Is there a virtue from it? Or, or can you make our small CC to be typical in, in this uh, mechanism? Yes, so indeed, uh, yeah, your characterization is correct. Maybe I should, um, I should uh, emphasize that this division is my own. So many people would place solutions in different slots. And you could even argue that the solution that I presented to you as dynamical is in reality anthropic, because it's telling you that you don't want a huge negative CC, otherwise we don't exist. Uh, so so the, the distinction I made is in reality inspired more by, by phenomenology. So these ideas that I'm calling dynamical are those that have a coupling to us that we can see today in the end. Uh, the conceptual difference I see between uh, these ideas and uh, anthropic is uh, essentially what you said, that, that this dynamical selection mechanism make our universe not only typical, but essentially uh, the only one surviving for a very long time in the multiverse. So you could see them, if you want, as a much uh, less detailed anthropic argument, right? So the anthropic argument from Weinberg for the, from the CC is already pretty robust and mild. Sure, it requires that you're not changing separately from the CC, the dark matter energy density, but apart from that, it's a very mild uh, assumption on the type of observers that you can have. Essentially, you want just enough entropy in the volume of the universe. Uh, and these ideas that I'm calling dynamical are trying to do the same for the X. So they are transitioning from these very detailed arguments about how chemistry looks like to something much more robust, which essentially, again, goes back to having enough entropy in, uh, in your horizon. OK, uh, we are running out of time, so we are behind the schedule. Thank you very much, Raffaele, for you, the interesting you. talk. So we will move to the next speaker, Joshua Rudeman. Are you ready? Hey, how are you? Hello. Can I, uh, um, can you try the sharing? Can, can you, screen? can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can share your screen with us. Okay, sure. excellent. There's a screen. So yeah, the-, the... Can, you see my, can, can you see my cursor if I move it? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay. Everything is fine. So the next speaker is uh, Joshua Ruderman from NIU. So he will talk about depleting or producing dark matter. So you are given 35 minutes and then five minute Q&A. Please go Thank on. Thank you. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this, this nice event. Uh, I wish I could be in Korea in person, um, but of course I can't. So I did the best thing I could do is go to Koreatown in New York City and I had some gopchang and there's a picture of it. So I'm, I'm thinking about Korea, although I'm not there. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna, we'll tell you about some sort of recent ideas, new ideas for how dark matter could be produced um, or depleted. Um, and I'll explain why, for the, what that distinction means. Okay, um, but first I just sort of begin with the constraints that I, that I always th think about because our, our models of dark matter are really guided by the remarkable constraints. So we know a lot actually about what dark matter is not. Um, and, and, and to me, sort of the most general powerful constraints, um, uh, certainly on WIMP-like models, um, well, they can't, the, the sort of one class of constraints that matter for lighter dark matter, and then another class that matters more for heavier. For, for lighter dark matter, um, indirect detection is very powerful. Um, and if, if dark matter were WIMP-like and lighter than 10 GV, you actually would expect this CMB to look different than, than it looks um, because of energy injection at the recombination era changing the ionization fraction, um, which would change the anisotropies. So, so Planck actually excludes WIMP-like dark matter lighter than 10 GeV. And on the other hand, heavier than 10 GeV direct detection is extremely powerful now. 
and has made remarkable progress in the last um, decades. Um, and actually, this sort of leaves nowhere for, for the simplest WIMPs because you should have seen it in CMB if it were light and you should have seen direct detection if it were heavier. Now, of course, there are many ways around these bounds, um, but still, I think they're very important for the, the types of models that we see. Anybody who works on this is sort of automatically knows how to get around these bounds, but, but, um, but they're very important. Um, okay, now, so here's my, my plan for this talk. Um, I wanna just begin with some general remarks about how models respond to experiments. And then I'll sort of review the, the sort of two, two classes of ideas for how dark matter could have arised in the early universe, either thermal or non-thermal, and, and sort of summarize the landscape of theory ideas for what dark matter could be. And then I'll talk about some recent work of myself and others identifying some new possibilities within this landscape. Okay. So first, uh, just an ex experiment. Um, and, and well, really a lot of the ideas now for dark matter models are responding to constraints like I summarized before. Um, so for example, because direct detection is so powerful for, for weak scale models, there's a lot of interest now looking for models where dark matter is lighter and then new experimental techniques to look for these models where dark matter is lighter. Um, another place, um, where a lot of model building ideas have come about is responding to experimental anomalies um, and seeing what models can, can explain them. And, and often it's not the simplest ones. Um, so a lot of development of more complex models have responded to anomalies. Um, famously, the Dama Libra for, for now, for, for many years, um, sees this modulating um, signal. It's hard to understand how it could be consistent with null results from other experiments uh, at this time. Um, and I'm going to take this second case an, an anomalies and just sort of give a brief, uh, very simplified history of sort of what, what this has led to. Um, and so Dama, even 20 years ago, it, it was uh, surprising that you would see this modulation and not have seen signal and standard direct detection. And, and in a sense, this led theorists to sort of birth uh, dark, dark sectors, the idea that maybe dark matter is not just a simple wimp, but something more complicated that could produce this signal um, and not signals in other experiments. So, so the, if, if dark matter scatters against nuclei inelastically, um, where you produce an excited dark matter state, this needs more energy and it favors heavier target nuclei. And then this could, at the time this idea was proposed, you, you could very easily have seen a signal in, in, in DAMA with, where, where iodine um, is heavy and not um, seen a signal in other direct detection experiments. So the, so this goes way back 2001. Um, and it really shows you that if you consider more complicated dark states, you can get new signals. Um, now, now DAMA is really being um, finally tested directly by other sodium iodine experiments. And, and in fact, there's been a lot of progress just in the last year and there's gonna be more progress soon from experiments like cosine 100 and, and ACE 112, um, which so far do not confirm it. Um, okay, um, so then, and, and I'll just mention, sorry, this old version of inelastic no longer explains DAMA. You, you would have seen it in, so, so now experiments like xenon um, exclude th th that idea for DAMA, but, but inelastic has taken a life of its own in a sense um, and, and, and arisen in many other forms in, in the last few years. So just as an example, um, it, it, it's been pointed out if dark matter in detectors is, is relativistic if it's boosted, unlike the, case, the kind of vanilla case where it would be non-relativistic, um, combining sort of boosted dark matter with inelastic leads to new signals. This was appreciated just in the last few years. Um, and inelastic is also sort of revived over the last year as a possible explanation of another anomaly, the, the xenon one ton um, sort of KeV scale electron um, an anomaly, which could be explained if an excited state of dark matter de, de excites, um, so down scatters and couples to electrons. Um, so this is not neither nothing on this slide is the old and elastic of 20 years ago that was addressing DAMA, but it shows uh, that sort of once you contemplate these more complex dark sectors, there's sort of rich experimental signals that can be applied and looked for in many diverse ways. Um, so 
So an elastic dark matter lives in various forms. So that sort of quick history um, is that examples of how dark sectors can lead to new experimental signals and, and, and sort of it, historically our interest in dark sectors has really largely been driven out of explaining sort of experimental anomalies of this type. Um, and the rest of this talk will be something a bit different showing that sort of dark sectors, multiple dark matter states can also lead to rich cosmologies that differ um, from the sort of simplest, um, say WIMP or simplest um, non-thermal models of dark matter. Um, so just like you can get new experimental signals, you can also get new cosmologies once we consider uh, there being multiple dark states. Okay. So I'm gonna now talk about sort of the WIMP cosmology and beyond um, and, and, and some of the various ideas. Um, but first I'll just sort of review the, the, the WIMP with, and I'm sure that most of you have seen this story many times, but it, it's still useful to go through it just as a comparison point if you wanna look at other more complicated models. Um, and the idea of how the WIMP in the early universe would have been thermalized there would be a very large number, um, and then it can be removed through annihilations to standard model particles. And, and sort of quantitatively, you solve this Boltzmann equation here to get the number density of the dark matter, and it depends on this cross section. And in, the solution intuitively is very simple to understand. Um, you start with a large number density. The number density, um, is, since it's in equilibrium, once it turns non relativistic, the number density drops exponentially with temperature until these annihilations become slower than Hubble expansion and then the number density is constant and, and, and should match the value you see today. And, and it is a very simple sort of back the envelope estimate you can do that number density times cross section is Hubble, solve that for number density, plug it in, and then you find the size of the cross section that you want and it should be weak scale. Um, okay, and, and here really for these thermal models, you start with a very large amount of dark matter, This because it's in equilibrium, you, have, you start with as much dark matter as photons. So the sort of question in these models is not how is dark matter produced, it's actually how is it depleted? And in the WIMP, it's depleted by say annihilations to standard model particles, for example. Okay. Um, so this would be sort of dark matter prototype number one to have in our heads. Um, prototype two um, will be an example of a non-thermal model. Um, it's similar in that it's in this example that I'm showing it involves annihilations, but now it's something annihilating into, into dark matter. And the sort of the opposite starting assumption for the WIMP, you assume dark matter has large interactions and begins in equilibrium and has as many, initially as many dark matter as photons. Um, for for non-thermal models, you'll often assume very weak interactions and maybe there's no dark matter initially. Um, so, so here the, this cross section should be always slower than the Hubble expansion. And then some other particle in equilibrium here labeled psi, um, which in general could be a particle from the standard model or some non beyond the standard model particle. Um, and, and it's annihilating into dark matter, but very slowly. Um, and, and then you're just sort of slowly producing the dark matter until you get the right amount. Um, so you get a similar looking Boltzmann equation, but now there's only one term because you can ignore the inverse process in this case. Um, and, and then the plot looks something like this. So you, if you assume you start with no dark matter, then you're sort of slowly producing it. Um, and, and it turns out that you'll be dominated by sort of temperatures near the mass of whichever of these states is, is heavier. And, and then the number density, you can also estimate in a simple back of the envelope way. Um, and, and, and the number density just goes as sort of cross section per, per Hubble at, at the sort of moment where, where this is dominated. Um, okay, so this idea is called freeze-in. Here I should, in this example, it's freeze-in from um, scattering from a two to two process. You can also consider freeze-in from other things like freeze-in from decays. It's a very similar story. Um, so here I'm just sort of summarizing the two ideas I showed. And I really wanna emphasize that WIMP and freeze-in, the simple cases I showed are really just examples of much broader classes of models, um, really thermal models or non-thermal models are sort of the two big archetypes. Um, and in, in the thermal case, you start with a large number density, you fall exponentially and then decouple. And in the non-thermal case, you start with none and you produce it slowly and get to the right value. So, so this 
the thing on the left it would be called freeze out and the thing on the right would be called freeze in. Um, and in, in the case on the left, the question you want to ask in general is what interactions are initially allowing dark matter to deplete. So sort of technically, you could, the dark matter initially has no chemical potential and there are some interactions required. And then at some point those interactions stop. So what interactions are causing it to deplete? When do they stop? And then that's how you compute the abundance. And, and there are many possible ways this can happen. And on, on the right case, you want to ask what interactions are producing it. And, and, and then you want to, and how big are those interactions? And then you can compute how much is produced. And, and one important difference on the left case, it doesn't depend on the initial condition because it, the initial condition is just thermal. Um, on the right case, it does, and people will normally assume zero initial abundance, but you're, you're but, it, but it's sensitive to that. If you were for, for some reason to start with some dark matter, it would change the story. So, so in that sense, the case on the left is insensitive to initial conditions, the case on the right is not. Okay. So um, you can sort of classify the sort of decisions that you make about the model to arrive at these simple stories. So here I showed the decisions that lead to WIMP it, or sort of the assumptions that underlie it, you're, you're, which are sort of implicit in my prior discussion, but you assume it's thermal. Um, you assume it's symmetric. If there's a dark matter particle and an antiparticle, unlike baryons where it's asymmetric, that was implicitly assumed. Um, and, and here, the, the assumption was two, two annihilations are moving it. Um, and, and here are the assumptions for freezing. You're assuming it's, it's non-thermal, non um, but it does have a thermal parent um, that some, some thermal particle was producing if you're an interaction, um, be it annihilation or, or, or decay or whatever. Um, and sort of, and then, I'll just throw in here another sort of classic dark matter candidate would be the axion. Um, and this is produced well, sort of in a different way as you can think of it as a classical field production through something called misalignment mechanism. Um, it's also non-thermal, but it's different than the freezing case I showed. Um, and okay, so those are sort of three examples, but there, there are many other sort of choices you could have made about the sort of assumptions that were underlying what led to the WIMP or, or freezing or axion. So you could sort of fill this chart out with a, a bunch of other possibilities. And I sort of like to think about when people have ideas for, for dark matter, how to place it among these assumptions. Um, so on the sort of non-thermal side, th there's other ways it can be produced um, from interacting with a thermal thing, like oscillations would be like how, how neutrin stereo neutrinos can be produced through Donaldson. It's called donaldson widger mechanism. Um, so they can freeze out and decay. It's called super wimp. Axions can also be produced through cosmic strings. Um, okay. And then on the thermal side, there are also many choices that you could make. You could, you could allow it to be asymmetric instead of symmetric. You can consider, say, instead of two to two, three to two. And then even within the two to two world, there's actually a lot of ideas for how dark matter could be produced. Um, so that's sort of now I'm show, showing sort of a summary of, of many of the ideas in, in literature. And many of these are over just the last few years. In my experience, when I show this flow chart, people who know very little about dark matter models are extremely unhappy that there are so many ideas. Um, people who know a medium amount are, are maybe happy to see it summarized, and people who know a lot about these models are also very unhappy because they would maybe summarize it in a different way. Okay. And, and I, well, one reason I wanted to show this is just to kind of now I'm going to talk about some recent ideas and I want to place them within this theory space. Um, and, and now for the rest of this talk, I'm going to discuss three ideas. Um, one non-thermal that we call pandemic, and then um, two actually thermal um, yeah, that I'll get to later. But first I want to um, talk about non-thermal and it's sort of a different option than freezing, although um, that we call pandemic dark matter. Um, and that'll be the, okay. Um, and this is the idea um, for freezing. I had sort of psi psi going to chi chi. And, and we make one very simple change is that here you have, whoops, dark matter also in the initial state. So, so you have dark matter is assumed to scatter against some um, particle that, that is assumed to be in thermal equilibrium. And here, here, dark matter is not in equilibrium. So you start with a very small amount of dark matter, and then it, it 
scatters against some state in equilibrium and leads to two dark matter. Um, and then well, the, the number density is given by the solution to, to this Boltzmann equation shown here. Um, yeah, and this was a recent idea by us and then very soon after by others. Um, and this actually, well, you can see if you start with one and then you produce two and, and, and you, you have a small amount initially, the amount of dark matter will, will grow exponentially like a runaway process, like a, um, like a bomb or, um, well, the reason we chose the word pandemic is another analogy would be that, that, that this would be similar to the exponential spread of a pathogen, something you may have heard about. Um, and, and so I wanna take a brief detour in, into um, the world of pathogens for one second, um, and then I'll relate this to, to dark matter. Um, but in fact, there's a, this is closely related to the, the very simple models for the spread of, of pathogens, which can be described by just a, a differential equation here. And this goes back way to, to 1920s and, and it's, it's called compartmental models because you classify people into different compartments, either um, people who are infected is I, um, S counts the number of people that are susceptible to be infected. And you can also introduce variables for those that are recovered or vaccinated or whatever. Um, so, so the rate of change of the infected individuals is given by sort of those that susceptible ones that are infected, this term, first term, or, or, or decreases as you recover. Um, and then the, the, this sort of leads to the famous reproductive number that, that measures sort of an, the average number that an infected person would infect. And, and if this reproductive number is greater than one, you get exponential growth in the number of infected people, um, which I will experience directly very much last year. Um, so this, this um, the reason I mentioned that um, is, is exactly the same differential equation. Um, that's the Boltzmann equation for, for this um, process we call transmission and, and, and these compartmental models. Um, it's exactly the same equation if you make the following identifications um, that you identify the number of infected individuals with the number density of dark matter, the number of susceptible individuals to the number density of this equilibrium state, the, the infection rate with the cross section of this process. And here the recovery, the, the analog of recovery is the Hubble expansion of the universe. It, um, as you spread out, then you're no longer infecting. Um, and, and then in this analogy, the, the R factor of pandemic dark matter is just the number density times cross section per Hubble. So, so in, in the virus case, R measures the average number of people that an infected person will infect. In the dark matter case, it measures the average number of times that a dark matter will undergo this process per Hubble time to produce more dark matter. Um, so you get the same exponential growth. Here this shows a, an example model. So a very simple model, we take dark matter to be a scalar chi that interacts with another scalar psi. We assume psi is in thermal equilibrium and there's a very small amount of chi. Then, oopsies, the solution, sorry, this, the solution to the Boltzmann equation is just a simple exponential um, with the growth rate determined by this R factor. Um, and here shows some numerical examples. And, and here we're, we're taking the initial amount of dark matter just as an initial condition that we vary. It could be produced in, however, from reheating or whatever you want. Um, and then at some moment, this cross section becomes faster than Hubble, the R factor becomes larger than one and you, you exponentially grow the amount of dark matter. Um, and, and then th this shuts off. Um, in this model, it shuts off when this particle in equilibrium becomes non-relativistic and becomes Boltzmann suppressed. R drops below one, the exponential growth in the number of dark matter stops. And now you sort of lock in some amount of dark matter that you can, and then you can choose these parameters to match the amount of dark matter we see. Um, so here I, I chose the, the initial condition as a free parameter, but you can um, sort of now make, make a model for that. So, so a simple choice is actually to use freezing to produce the initial amount of dark matter. Um, so now in, the, in this example, we would have two interactions. The, the interaction on the left will produce, initially produce some dark matter. Um, 
and that and and we choose a value of this coupling that's far smaller than the amount you would need for the diagram on the left to produce dark matter on its own. But then this exponential growth process kicks in and produces the amount of dark matter we see. So here you see uh, solutions of that type. And so you can have now a very small coupling that wouldn't normally have worked for freeze-in, but then, and then a period of exponential growth leading to the amount of dark matter we, we see now. Okay, and this shows the sort of phase diagram for, for this model where on the x-axis here, you're varying the um, coupling that controls the process on the left. And on the y-axis, you're varying the coupling that determines this transmission. And then in this blue region is where the relative density can be produced um, by this pa pandemic idea. And, and, and then there are other regions where, where, for example, it would be just thermal um, or standard freezing. OK. And finally, just in terms of si signatures, um, this state psi should be in thermal equilibrium. And the simplest way that might occur is if it's in equilibrium with the standard model. So, so if you, for example, take it to couple through, through the Higgs boson, then this state psi you can look for in direct detection. And the state psi actually will now decay to dark matter. Um, so there'll be some small amount of psi that, that could decay and that you can look for its effects, for example, in the cosmic microwave background. Um, so we find that there's some parameter space where this is allowed and, and in cases where it could be detected in direct detection or or through its effects on the cosmic microwave background. And, and here you're really looking for this other state, not for the dark matter directly, but for the state in equilibrium, that, 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 which in the analogy would be the people susceptible to being infected are the ones you would look for. Okay, so that was a quick summary of, of that idea. Um, and, and, and that was in, that was a non-thermal model because you started with very little dark matter and then you have to ask how is it produced? It was produced this exponential growth. I now want to just give some brief comments about recent work on thermal models. So on the left side of my flow chart, um, so forbidden and a new idea they were working on we call bouncing. Um, okay, so first forbidden. Um, no, for norm, normally for WIMPs, you assume dark matter annihilates into a state whose mass is lighter than the dark matter. But, and, and if, the, if the dark matter were at rest, then that would be the only thing allowed by energy conservation. But in the early universe, because there's a temperature, um, sometimes dark matter will be fast, and then you can produce also states whose mass is heavier, um, like, like in a collider. Um, and, and if dark matter dominantly annihilates into states that are heavier than its mass, then this idea is called forbidden dark matter, and it has a long history going back to the 90s and was revived a couple of years ago by Raffaele, the previous speaker, and myself. And, and the, here you have to be careful about how you compute thermally averaged cross sections. And, and, and these cross sections have an exponential dependence on the mass splitting um, because only an exponentially small fraction of the dark matter will have enough kinetic energy to produce these heavier states. Um, the, the, this idea predicts dark matter is very light compared to the electric weak scale because of this exponential suppression. Um, you sort of would normally start with parameters that would lead to, to a much larger cross section, which means smaller dark matter mass. Um, and, and so, and although it's lighter, it can't be too much lighter because of the exponential. Like, for example, if sort of A and B were 10 times heavier than dark matter, the exponential tells you, forget about it, you're never going to find anything heavy enough to make that. So, so you, you really want a splitting that's between initial and final state that's maybe order tens of percent or, or less to be able to access heavier states. So this model is actually predictive of the dark matter mass. If it's annihilating to this heavier state, the mass needs to be near by um, to tens of per predictive at the tens of percent level. Now, now, prior work on this assumed that dark matter was annihilating into some new particle. We've looked at cases where A and B are dark photons. Um, but just recently, we wanted to ask, could A and B be standard model particles? And then the nice thing is we know the mass of standard model particles so that would predict the mass of dark matter. And we found uh, actually several different examples that work in this recent paper here. Um, dark matter could um, dominantly annihilate to muons, to, to taus, or to a mixed state of muon and tau. Um, and, and dark matter is just a bit lighter than these leptons in each case. And, and this is predictive of the dark matter mass, um, which would be within say tens of percent or less of uh, either the muon mass, the average of the muon and tau mass, or the tau mass. Um, and we looked at explicit example where it's coupling through a scalar mediator. 
Um, the muon case is interesting because th this model would um, predict a deviation to the g minus two, and, and there's some parameter space where you could where it could be the dark matter and consistent with uh, the observations there. But, um, but but in general, what we, what we like about this is it's very predictive for the dark matter mass. Unlike most, normally, WIMPs can really range many 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 masses, but if you assume dark matter annihilates to a standard model state and is lighter than it, then there's one mass. So if we ever in the future were to see, say, from drift detection or whatever, that dark matter has a mass of um, the average of the tau and the muon mass, then this is probably why. Um, OK. And one more, um, whoops, one more type of dark matter before I conclude. Um, this is some ongoing work th that I'm taking a risk and talking about. Um, with NEO and Bibishan. Um, and, and it's sort of, the, normally the way I summarize things before is thermal models start with a lot and then deplete. Non-thermal models, you start with none and you make it. And, and, and this is sort of interesting. It's a thermal model. We, 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 we have identified thermal models where you start with a lot of dark matter and deplete it. But unlike sort of standard freeze out where you just deplete it, there are cases where you can get what we call a bounce, where you deplete it and then increase it to the final value by some amount. Um, and the, this um, is, a, we're, we're assuming this is an equilibrium process. Um, and here um, I write the sort of expression for the equilibrium number density of a non relativistic state. And the, the reason that this and normally that you would think that this just depletes. However, um, we're, we often neglect this chemical potential term, but if the chemical potential is, um, is positive and large enough, then you can actually get create cases where while in equilibrium, the number density increases. Um, yeah, and sort of quantitatively for, for this expression to increase, you need to satisfy the following bound. So, so roughly speaking, the chemical potential, if it's bigger than the mass, um, then it increases. And, and we've found that there are cases where you can have thermorelic dark matter um, where there is a, where dark matter inherits a large enough chemical potential by its interactions with other states that, that, that its freeze out will go through a bounce. Um, and I'll just show you sort of two, two examples. Um, so this could happen from two to two interactions. So if, if the, so here, um, if these are sort of three states in equilibrium, and if the final interaction involving dark matter is just this two to two process here, it encodes this relationship among the chemical potentials of these three states. And, and if you choose masses such that there's more mass on the left side than the right side of this diagram, then you can, trigger a bounce where, where dark matter sort of inherits a chemical potential from this state side two, and, and then will increase to, to the observed value. And, and this can also occur in models where dark matter is produced by three to two um, interactions. Um, so so if, you, if the final interaction involving dark matter is this process shown here, and, and if there's more mass on the left side than the right side, then, then dark matter um, can, can, can also um, bounce. So really, this is just a teaser because this is ongoing work. So I just wanted to, to tell you to predict that you'll hear more about this from us soon. OK, and I'm about, I think I'm out of time, um, but I'll just conclude. So I showed you the, the, the sort of diverse space of ideas for how dark matter could be produced. A lot of the recent progress in this space can, is going beyond the simplest case of one dark matter particle and considering what happens if you have two or three particles interacting. Uh, really, a lot of these ideas can be summarized just by that extension. I, and in the beginning, I showed you the sort of, a, it was actually anomalies like Adama initially that, that maybe led us to consider models with two dark matter instead of one that can give very different experimental signals. Two, two, dark, two dark states can also give very different cosmology. Um, and, and sort of all the ideas I showed, these recent ideas all have in common that there's sort of at least two states interacting and that leads to a different cosmology. And, and, and here I discussed three sort of recent ideas. Um, one non-thermal where dark matter can be produced um, by scattering against the state in equilibrium and undergo exponential growth in number density. 
Um, and I showed a case where dark matter annihilates into standard model leptons and that predicts the dark matter mass. And I showed, uh, well, I just sort of teased you about this idea that you could have a different type of thermal relic that goes through a process called the bounce. Um, okay, so that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. And now the session is open to questions. Among the discussion panel. If not, um, <clears throat> in the meantime, when people are preparing the question, I will ask. So for pandemic dark matter, yes. it, it seems it has a highly, I mean, exponentially sensitive dependence on the initial abundance. Absolutely. Is it correct? Oh, so no, no, you have an exponential dependence on the y chi strength zero, of the interaction. Right? On the on the interact, you only have a, the final abundance only depends logarithmically on on the in the, in the initial abundance, but but yeah, you're exponentially sensitive to the cross section. Oh, 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 I see. But so so this is uh, uh, on the opposite direction compared to the standard uh, thermal scenario where the initial condition is not so important anyhow, just the mass and uh, cross sections determined, but uh. well, no, no. Here, here, you are only logarithmically sensitive to the initial condition. So, so the initial condition is is, is extremely unimportant here. Um, but you're exponentially sensitive to the cross section. This uh, y chi x zero, isn't it the initial condition? So if yeah, I started yeah. from 10 times smaller, then I would end up 10 times smaller. So I mean- oh, Sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm, really what I mean is if you want to ask what should the size of this coupling be to produce the observed abundance, then oh, the answer yeah, to that yeah. question I, I, depends on the distribution. That, that, that's what I meant. Yeah. on the couplings, but also there is a kind of uh, initial abundance dependence on your prediction. That's that's what uh, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, sure, sorry. So, so the final abundance you can see just depends um, so for a given exponential, it, that, you can choose that, y chi x zero. Yeah. Yeah, but this is true for for any reason. It depends on the initial abundance. I mean, so for for any non-thermal model, it, it it depends on the initial abundance. Mm -hmm. Um, but but for for standard reason, it would depend sort of as a linear, linearly or whatever. Or, or, but 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 here, actually, if you ask what what the coupling should be, it only depends on. Okay. And then. Also for, for this uh, psi and chi, I mean, uh, I'm more on theory side. So you're introducing two scalar fields which are singlets. And can you embed it in a more theory motivated uh, framework or yeah, you, it's a really you're good not question. interested? That's a good question. We haven't thought, thought about them yet. Yeah, so really just playing with it at the level of a toy model is how I'm really to think, to think, thinking about it, but, but yeah, the, 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 so it would be interesting to, to sort of UV complete this and, and ask today, are there natural cases where these are composites or, or whatever? Okay, but and at, at, there, there is a question from, uh, so can you check this Q&A or I can just yes. read it for you? So Hyunmin Lee was asking, can pandemic dark matter be self-interacting? Is it possible to populate only from a smaller number of relativistic dark matter in the beginning by using self-interactions? Oh, interesting. Um, maybe, so by, well, I guess it, it certainly could be to number one. Um, number two, I guess, does he mean two to three, like two chi to three chi? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I suppose, uh, why not? Um, that's a good question. Why chi x zero? Yeah, yeah. I would think I would think it could it could be. Oh, well, you need to have some though. So so we're yeah. Actually, I don't. Know. You have to have something to start. If you have nothing, if you have no chi, then it's not going to populate from self interaction. So maybe I don't understand. And then the other question is uh, from Takahiro Terata. So when the stability of dark matter is not ensured by symmetry, isn't a decay channel opened by radiative corrections? In, in general, sure, it depends on the context. Um, <laughs> as, yes, I'm not sure if, if this question is about one of the scenarios I'm talking about here. Um, 
in, in, in the case that's on the slide now, there's a Z2 symmetry that, that, that protects the, the dark matter. So there, there can be a symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's true of all the models I've shown here that, that, there, that, that it can be a Z2 protected. Yeah, it's consistent symmetry. with Z2 symmetry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but in general, um, if there is no symmetry, then in general, you do have to worry about the K. I agree with the question. Okay. Okay. Seems that's it. Are there other questions? No? Since you provided so many interesting scenarios. <laughs> so what's your goal? You, you just uh, complete the list of uh, possible dark matter abundance generation or? Oh, well, why, yeah, why, why yeah, do this? So by, by doing this exercise, what, what do you gain? But yeah, in, e in each case, they're, they're, that then if you look at it, you know, there'll be different phenomenology. So, so different ideas for how dark matter is produced will, will uh, be compatible with different mass scales and compatible with different interactions with the standard model. So I think- the So, so once dark, we discover some new particle at a weird mass scale, then uh, there is a chance that even uh, explaining it uh, without modifying the standard cosmology. For example, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think the most interesting thing is the experimental side to me, but I'm only a theorist, so what can I do? So, so, so each, each model will point to different, will be, will be tested by different experiments, different combinations of experiments. So, so I think we, we want to come at it from both directions. We want to understand what are the different ways dark matter could be produced and what are generic experimental signatures that these different ways point to. And then as experimental results occur, we can view them in the context of these models. So, so to compare, that exercise you want to know what are all the ways dark matter could be produced and and then how can the, all those ways be tested unfortunately there are a lot of ways dark matter could be produced but uh until we know which is correct i think we should explore the theory the theory space and the experimental portal space mm. okay thank you very much for both of the speakers and uh, we are on time <laughs> so <laughs> this session is uh, closed now thank you very much thank you yeah uh, also, Josh, you, you know, you, you may not know that uh, there will be a CKC workshop next year. Have you heard of it? I'm not sure. Uh, that's, that's what uh, Sung Jun told me. So, so next year it will be happening on site. So, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, you have a chance to visit Korea. <laughs> okay. that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> okay. Thanks for accepting the invitation and giving a nice talk. Ciao. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks to the organizers. Bye. Thanks.